I am so excited to see that there are so many people interested in good health. My name is Dr. Deborah Faust. I'm the Vice President of Service Education and Training for MD Prevent. And I'm here this morning to introduce you to a gentleman who is truly an inspiration to all who know him, Dr. Stephen Charlap, our Chief Service Officer of MD Prevents, Preventive Medicine and Learning Centers. If I may, Dr. Charlap is an honors graduate of Yeshiva University and the New York University School of Medicine. He trained as a general surgeon at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York before going on to earn his MBA at the Harvard Business School in Boston. As co-founder and chief medical officer of Health Drive, a two-time Inc. 500 company, he built an organization that grew to be the largest provider of medical and dental services, serving over 5 million patients in 1,500 long-term care facilities across 13 states. Dr. Charlap is also the author of nursing, oh, excuse me, the author of Making Sense of Nursing Homes, A Guide for Families. Dr. Charlap's experience with millions of Americans who suffered from chronic disease that led them to become institutionalized motivated him to start MD Prevent. His goal? To support and educate future generations as to how they might make lifestyle changes so they can avoid a similar fate. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Charlap. Okay, so uh, I'm going to have to juggle a couple of things here because I got to control. I think we shut that off. Turn it off. Yeah, that's pretty good. How's that? Okay, um, I'm going to need to control the mic, this thing which controls the uh, PowerPoint presentation, and my laptop at the same time. So uh, please bear with me. Um, let me start by saying it says here a complimentary lecture, and uh, I hate to do this right from the start, but I need you guys to. Uh, pay admission price, and that is I want you all to stand up right now, okay? And um, you'll learn during this lecture, everybody stand up, you're not standing up, I'm going to get uh, one of my preventioneers to help you up. And uh, I learned uh, over the course of um, my extensive study into longevity that one of the most important things uh, is friendship. So I want you all to join me today in wishing and singing happy birthday to a very dear friend of mine, Michael Rose, who's with us today. He's a very dear friend. He's a co-founder of MD Prevent. So let's sing happy birthday to Michael Rose to start. <laughs> happy birthday, dear Michael. Happy birthday, dear Michael. Happy birthday, dear Michael. Happy birthday to you. All right, great. All right, everybody have a seat. Uh, you may remember from the uh, postcard that described this program, we didn't use the word lecture. We used the word conversation. And what does conversation mean? It means it's a two-way, back and forth. I'm going to ask you questions. I'm going to ask you to shout out answers. You're going to ask me questions. Maybe I'll shout back some answers. And we'll keep this very... Uh, Interesting. I like to call it edutainment, uh, more than just education, or clearly more than just entertainment. Okay, a uh, couple of pieces of housekeeping. Uh, at the end of the program, uh, there's a survey, pro uh, discussion survey. We ask you to fill it out. By filling it out, you also get another raffle ticket, which entitles you to be entered into the raffle for the lean program, which we are raffling off today. So please take a few minutes at the end. All right, so first, let me introduce you to the Preventioneers. We call ourselves Preventioneers because we have pioneered and we continue to pioneer new approaches to prevention. And you see, we also like to have some fun because staying healthy isn't all about didactic approaches to learning. It's about experiential approaches to learning. And you got to enjoy yourself because things that you enjoy resonate and is something you want to keep doing. So this is my wonderful group of preventioneers. As Cindy mentioned at the end of the program, you should feel free to come talk to any one of us. Among the preventioneers, again, we have nurse practitioners, we have health psychologists, we have a registered dietitian slash nutritionist. We also have an uh, exercise physiologist, he's not here today. We have a yoga certified instructor, we have other health instructors, we have a health educators, instructional designers, we have a 
an incredible team of people that are focused on one goal, and that is helping you with your health. Okay. So this may be a familiar sight to some of you. This is the hallway of a nursing home, and as mentioned earlier, I spent almost two decades taking care of patients in nursing homes and assisted living. And what I realized is that the average person in a nursing home is about 83 years old. It is typically a woman, and they have been institutionalized because they are sick, and they have some chronic disease, and that chronic disease has developed over a number of years, and they end up, uh, despite sometimes the family's best efforts to keep them at home, they end up getting institutionalized, and they come to be dependent on the kindness of strangers. And I will tell you that those strangers are not always so kind, and therefore, um, it is a fate that is unfortunately unavoidable today. Uh, and I'm not saying that the strangers are not kind to damn the industry. I'm simply pointing out the reality of the situation, okay? There are people that you've never met who are now responsible for taking care of you at the end of your life. And it's a very difficult environment because if you take great care of the patient, they pass away. If you don't take great care of the patient, they pass away. So the patients you meet, unfortunately, many end up passing away. So it was that experience specifically that led me to the conclusion that it wasn't the nursing home industry we had to do something about. It was the people who were ending up in the nursing homes that needed to change the course of their lives and avoid it. And I hope that you will learn today that it is very possible to change what happens to you by some simple lifestyle modifications. So I will get to that over the course of this lecture. We're going to look at a number of different communities where people are living longer, et cetera. Okay. Now, what are some of the chronic diseases that uh, end up uh, leading to people being institutionalized and, in fact, are responsible for 7 out of 10 deaths right now in the United States? We've got heart disease. We've got cancer. We've got diabetes. We've got being overweight and obese, and we have COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is associated with smoking. These are the leading killers. These are the lifestyle-related diseases. They are, in fact, called diseases of affluence. Now, you might say, how can it be a disease of affluence when somebody living in a poverty level is getting these exact same diseases? Well, the reality is, even those living at the poverty level, are living considerably better than people lived hundreds of years ago. And so even today, everybody is basically suffering from these diseases of affluence. Okay, so let's get to today's lecture. The role genetics plays in longevity and how to live to 100. So by a show of hands, who would like to live to 80? Okay, who would like to live to 90? Who would like to live to 100? All right, the rest of you can go home. OK. So let's talk about the word longevity. I want to define some of the terms in the title. Longevity is length of life. So whether you die at 40, you die at 120, it's still the same longevity. It's how long we live. OK, genes and genetics. What is genetics? Genetics is the study of heredity and how our genes interact with the environment. Genes, as you may remember from the famous double helix Watson and Crick Nobel Prize winning research, is uh, genes are a part of your DNA. DNA being deoxyribonucleic acid. It's made up of four amino acids. I'm not going to go beyond that. Uh, you had enough of that in high school biology, and I'm sure you're happy to be past it. But genes are very important. But today we're going to find out exactly how important are genes? So here's a very cute picture, okay? When we think about genes from a societal perspective, we think about what's called phenotype, the physical manifestation of the gene. So you can tell by the faces that this is a uh, father and son. Remember that old commercial, the father was smoking and then the son would smoke and they would say like father, like son? Well, here's a picture. They both have similar faces. They're both sleeping in the same uh, position. And we say, you see, genes is everything. But then again, you know that you don't necessarily look like your parents. You don't act like your parents, uh, so on and so forth. 
So uh, one of the things I want to tell you, there's a famous Oscar Wilde quote, okay, in reference to children. I thought this was a good segue to it. Oscar Wilde said, in reference to children, when they're little, they adore you. When they're teenagers, they judge you. And when they're adults, they may forgive you. So I wasn't very surprised when one day I get a judgmental email from my youngest daughter, who's a senior in high school, that says, Abba, my environmental science teacher says you're doing a terrible thing, okay? And I typically don't encourage texting in the middle of the day from school, but this was too much to resist, okay? So I texted back and I wrote, why? And she wrote back to me because she says you're trying to keep people alive longer and we need people to die in order to make room for the next generation. <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to judge that environmental science teacher, but I don't think she's talking about people living to 100, 120. I think she may be talking about people living to 200, 300. And in fact, when we talk about the burden on society of living longer, it turns out to be just the opposite. Okay? And in fact, over the course of this lecture, we're going to do a little game. I'm going to say, the longer you live, and you're going to say, the healthier you've been. Okay? So let's practice. The longer you live, the healthier you've been. All right, one more time. The longer you live, the healthier you've been. Exactly. The longer you live, the healthier you've been. So in fact, as you live older, you're not only not a burden on society, you're a great contributor. And we're going to find out that among one of the centenarian communities, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes, they revere elder people, okay? Because they understand the knowledge and the wisdom that's accumulated over the years. And in fact, there's a famous biblical passage, honor your parents so that you may live longer, okay? The first biblical secret of how to live longer is be good to your parents. Okay. This is a nice kind of continuum of looking at genetic disease and environmental disease. On the left-hand side, we have Down syndrome, okay, which is obviously a mutation to the 21 chromosome, and it results in uh, development of a disease called Down syndrome. Uh, we have things like fetal ket ketonuria. That's why you can't drink uh, NutraSweet type products, hemophilia, or blood disorder. And then all the way on the right side, we have things like tuberculosis, which is an infectious disease, scurvy, when you have no vitamin C whatsoever. And in the middle, we have some of the more common diseases, peptic ulcer, diabetes, heart disease. And what this thing actually represents is a continuum to tell us that genetics does play a role in the development of disease but environment also plays a role. So let's find out exactly uh, how much. All right, but before we do that, uh, let's talk about the most dreaded of all diseases. I like to say this is the worst six-letter word in the alphabet, cancer, okay? So there's a theory, and again, let me reiterate, there's a theory that we are constantly developing cancer and that our immune system is defeating that cancer. And in fact, most cancers are not genetically predisposed. They are mutations in a particular cell that repeat themselves until that cell uh, becomes uh, connected to a bunch of other cells and develops into a tumor. So when our immune system is strong, there's a belief that we can fight cancer. And when our immune system is weakened, Okay, based on lifestyle, we become more susceptible to cancer. For example, in breast cancer in particular, the studies are very definitive. If you are overweight and are a breast cancer survivor, you significantly increase the likelihood of the breast cancer returning. And reality is, when you have breast cancer or some other cancer and you have surgery, uh, the doctors say you have a clean bill of health, but nobody really knows what's happening on a microscopic level. But if your immune system is strong, we can defeat that cancer. But if we allow our immune system to become weak, we make ourselves considerably more susceptible. Okay, so let's get into the whole thing of longevity. And uh, <laughs> so here's a very cute uh, picture. This gentleman says to his, hair, his caregiving team, my parents died, their parents died, their parents died, it runs in the family, okay? So we do know one thing. 
We are genetically predisposed to die, okay? Living forever is simply not in the cards. Not today, probably not ever, unless they download our consciousness to a computer and we live as a, you know, in some computer world in the future. But in, uh, in terms of flesh and blood, it's probably fair to say that mankind will never, as an individual, live forever. Okay. So let's play a game here. Oops. Okay, we can't play the first game, but how, well you got the answer there. The average male is expected to live to 76. Let's play a game on the second one, I'll be more careful. Ah, how about the average female, anybody? 84, And the answer is? 81. But let me tell you something about that. These numbers are a little bit uh, misleading because factored into the average life expectancy numbers is people, uh, children who die at childbirth, accidents, suicides, okay? All those numbers are factored in. So these numbers are actually misleading. The average number is now considered 79, but again, it's a misleading number because uh, we always talk about that in few past generations, nobody lived longer. It's not true, okay? People did die earlier from infections, and antibiotics has really made a big difference. But if you look at famous artists and musicians from hundreds of years ago, many of them lived into their 80s and 90s. And so we've been living into our 80s and 90s for many years, and in fact, all these pills and drugs and science is really not keeping many of us alive longer, okay? It's just the the uh, death rate of children uh, being born going down is what is increasing the average life expectancy. All right, let's play another game. Hmm, I wonder what she's thinking about. She's thinking, I wonder what percentage does my genetics play in my longevity, okay? So by a show of hands, when you see a number that you think is correct, raise your hand. 95%. Who thinks genetics plays the role of 95%? One person. Okay. Give her a koopy doll. <laughs> All right. Next number. 80%. Who thinks 80%? Role of genetics. We got another gentleman. Wins another koopy doll. 65%. Who thinks 65%? Oh, a few more hands go up in the air. Still, the crowd is skeptical. 45%. Do I hear 40? Oh, this was a good one. I see you guys are starting to get into it. 45%. 30%. Oh, those stra the stragglers. All right, let's see if there's anybody left for 15%. Ooh, one, two, three. The correct answer is 25 to 30%. Okay. So if 30% is genetics, does that mean we control 70%? That's what it would seem to suggest, right? So there was a study done by the MacArthur Foundation. It was started in 1987, and it lasted for 12 years, okay? And this book, Success for Aging, uh, was based on that study. And that study included uh, a review of something called the Swedish Twin Registry. 25,000 twins, 72-year studies, they looked at 25,000 sets of twins. And they looked at these twins who had been separated at birth. I don't know what they have against twins in Sweden that they separate them all at birth, but apparently there were a lot of separations at birth. And they tracked them, and guess what they found? Based on the way they lived, they either did or did not develop diseases. In fact, just yesterday I was talking to a, a twin uh, who was pointing out to me how uh, her and her sister look um, uh, considerably different. And so she was pointing out, look, it really does come down to lifestyle. So this is how we know, because as you know, these were identical twins, genetically identical. And yet, they did not develop the same diseases. They did not live the same length of life, okay? And that's why we can with great confidence say that genetics only plays a role of about 25 to 30 percent. Okay, so 
When we talk about genetics versus environment, we talk about the classic argument about nurture versus nature. Nature being the genetics, which we now know is about 30 percent. Nurture being primarily lifestyle, which we now know about 70 percent. And we talk about the combined impact of both of them on longevity. Okay, so here's a little uh, cute cliche. Uh, those of you may again refer back to your high school biology and Darwinism, the whole uh, premise of uh, uh, natural selection, uh, use it or lose it. And as you see in this cartoon, one guy is using it or he's afraid he's going to lose it. The other guy is considerably overweight. One might even say morbidly obese. He didn't use it and he lost it. In this case, he really gained it. So this is a little bit uh, misclassified. So, in summary, the MacArthur's Foundation's 16 experts came to this conclusion. And it's, again, it's a very simplistic conclusion. Use it or lose it. Okay? And what that means is, if you don't stay physically active, if you don't keep your mind physically uh, alert, and so on and so forth, uh, like any muscle that you don't use, you know, at the age of 50 and above, you start losing muscle mass at about a rate of 1% of the mass a year. And so, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, the importance of uh, exercise. Okay, so longevity in you. So here's a cute cartoon I found. Uh, for those who can't read it, it says, uh, the wife is sitting at a computer and she says, according to this, I should live to the ripe old age of 98. And the husband says, what do you mean? And she says, well, by entering your current age, health, issues, weight, lifestyle, and diet, this website computes all the data and establishes your life expectancy. And she turns to her husband and says, Want to give it a try? And he says, oh, no, not really. And then we notice that he's got a little bit of a pouch there in his stomach. So he doesn't exactly want to know that maybe the stuff he's doing isn't exactly so good for him. OK, so let's move to understanding. So who's living to 100? They're called centenarians. By definition, a centenarian is somebody who lives over 100. Does anybody know who this lady is? Keep going. Keep going. 122. This is Jean Louise Calment. Jean Louise Calment, unfortunately, did pass away in 1997 at the age of 122. She sold canvas to Vincent Van Gogh out of her parents' fabric shop in Collis. Okay. Uh, I am sure she had an amazing life. She lived to 122. She is the oldest known person on record, uh, be, uh, beyond, of course, biblical times, that lived beyond 120. What did she die of? <laughs> I'm sure... Um, <laughs> okay, so... There are actually three very famous communities that have a large per, uh, percentage of centenarians. One of them is Okinawa, Japan. The Okinawans, there are 740 centenarians, 90% of whom, by the way, are women, uh, out of a population of about 1.3 million. So there are about 50 centenarians per every 10,000. How many times do you think that is a multiple of the centenarian rate in the United States. Anybody want to guess? Ten times. No, less than that. Three and a half times. Okay? Three and a half times. So, how do the Okinawans do it? Here's how they do it. No tobacco. Well, that's an easy one, right? Little alcohol. You know, one of the questions I'm often asked is, Steve, is alcohol good or bad for you? That seems to be the most popular question I get. And the answer is both. If you're healthy, it's bad for you. If you're unhealthy, it's a little bit good for you. Okay? <laughs> kind of confusing. All right, let's do that again. If you're healthy, it's bad for you. If you're unhealthy, it's good for you. Why? Well, it turns out that alcohol has some effect on your arterial system. It makes it more flexible. And why do you need a more flexible arterial system? It's if your arteries are already hardening. So when you're not taking care of yourself and you're getting hardening of the arteries, the alcohol actually gives a little bit of a benefit. Okay? The stuff about Reservatrol uh, that's in the, the red wine, 
You're not drinking anywhere. I mean, you, you'll be dead by the time you get anywhere close to the levels. You'll be dead several times over. By the time you get close to the levels, you need to get the so-called benefits of resveratrol, which, by the way, there have been no studies yet to demonstrate any benefit in humans, but that's a whole different topic. That's actually next week. Uh, the long and short of it is that um, alcohol has recently, in a very good study, and I say good study because there are many of bad studies, in a good study it was associated with an increased incidence of cancer, particularly in women, increased cancer rate by 17%, even in very moderate amounts, okay, less than a glass a day. Um, I believe, I'm not 100% sure that it was breast cancer. Uh, I believe it was breast cancer, but again, I generally would recommend minimizing your alcohol. Now, some people say alcohol is very good for stress, and stress is a killer, and we'll get to that in a moment. But let's go, let's continue down the list. Low calories, they eat until they're 80% full. They have a word for it, a phrase for it. Anybody have any idea what the phrase is? Hora hachibu. <laughs> Hora hachibu means you eat to your 80% full because we know that it takes about 20 minutes for the brain to catch up with the stomach. And the Okinawans figured out that when they just about start feeling like they may be full, it's a good time to stop eating. They eat lots of fruits and vegetables, fiber and healthy fats, okay? And that's a lecture for another day, but there are healthy fats and there are unhealthy fats. We need fats in our diet, okay? We need fats in our diet. In fact, let me ask a question. Who in this room is on a statin? A statin, lower your cholesterol, okay? Have any of your doctors ever discussed with you getting off the statin? No. A couple of people said yes, most of you said no. Why? Why when you go on a statin do you need to stay on a statin for the rest of your life? Why? Yes, it's definitely good for the drug industry. <laughs> Other reasons? Okay, well high level of cholesterol. Well there's two reasons why you have high level of cholesterol. One is you have a genetic predisposition to high level of cholesterol, which most of us do not have. Okay, or you're eating the wrong foods and you're raising your cholesterol. So why doesn't the doctor encourage you to eat the right foods and get you off these statins? Because just today I read a study, and I can't tell you how good this study is because I didn't get all the details, that statins are associated with an increased risk of cancer. And in fact, the study pointed me to an NIH uh, website where there was a review of statins and their link to cancer and I got to tell you something, it wasn't very encouraging. They weren't quite saying that it causes cancer. They weren't quite saying that it doesn't cause cancer. The long and short of it is, just because you take a drug once or twice or a year or five years doesn't necessarily mean you need to take it for the rest of your life. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go home and throw away your statins, okay? You really need to talk to your doctor about it. But I am encouraging you to go and talk to your doctor and ask him. Do I really need to stay on a statin for the rest of my life? And next week's lecture, I talk about drugs and supplements and vitamins and the effects of taking them. I know that I used to take a statin. And when I took a statin, I would think, hmm, can I have the pizza? I know pizza is not necessarily good for me. It's high in saturated fat. But I'm on a statin. I'm cool. So I can go ahead and eat that pizza. So when we're on these drugs, we live in this fantasy world that somehow they're magic bullets and they're going to protect us and we can do whatever we want. And the reality is, it's simply not true. Okay. They handle stress by staying physically active with gardening and daily walking. Now, let me assure you, there are no large gym facilities on the island of Okinawa. Okay? They're not doing the PX90. They're not going to the Cybex machines. They're not getting on the treadmills and the ellipticals. They're just physically staying active. Okay? They're not going to the health club and trying to find the nearest parking space to the door. Okay? They're just staying physically active. They're women have strong and frequent social interaction, okay? So, let's practice a little bit of longevity. I want you to turn to the person to the left and right of you, and I want you to introduce yourself.
All right, now the people behind and in front of you, introduce yourself. Hello. Hi, how are you? All right, so we all now may be living a little bit longer because we just increased our social interaction. And guess what? 175 friends on Facebook it does not count. Okay? And we'll get to that a little bit later. And finally, finally, the Japanese have something called the Okinawans, ikigai. Anybody know what ikigai is? Purpose. They have a purpose. So let me tell you something. You eat exceptionally well. You exercise all the time. You don't have any stress, but you have no reason to get out of bed. Okay? <laughs> You're not going to live a long life. And let me tell you something. In 2008, when I sold my first organization, I retired. And I went to everybody I knew and I said, 168. Anybody know what 168 stands for? 168. The number of hours in a week. I had figured out the number of hours in a week. And I also figured out that if I slept seven hours a day, that knocked off a whole 49. And I only had 119 hours left to do something with every week. Okay? That's how crazy I went doing nothing. <laughs> Okay, so those who look forward to retirement, don't look forward to it, okay? It's not quite cracked up to be what they claim it to be, particularly at an early age. In fact, I don't wish any of my children to succeed very early in life because I don't think there could be anything worse than very early success. You know, I, you build a company, you sell it for millions of dollars, you never have to work anymore. I think that's the worst thing that could ever happen to you, okay? Okay, well, I'm not saying that you can't be happy in retirement. I'm just saying for some of us, premature retirement uh, was not a good thing, okay? Particularly for me. All right. That's, uh, men do need social interaction. We're just not as capable of it. <laughs> okay? I mean, that's just the reality. We're just not as capable of social interaction. It's not every friend that wishes another friend happy birthday and makes a whole group of people sing it, okay? <laughs> But uh, men should, because it will help men. And as you'll learn a little bit later, that's probably why women live longer. Because we have, they have better friends than we do. Okay, so here's a cute little cartoon, and the girl says to her mother, Mom, I've made a decision. I refuse to take part in the growing health care crisis that faces our country. And the mom says, that's great, sweetie. And the girl says, I'm moving to Okinawa. Okay? So, uh, speaking about the healthcare system, it reminds me of a Walter Cronkite uh, quote, where Walter Cronkite said, in reference to the American healthcare system, that it's neither healthy, caring, nor system. <laughs> okay, so based on this slide, do you think we should all move to Okinawa? Yeah. Uh, wrong answer. <laughs> Not so fast. And I'll tell you why. Because the Okinawans who leave Okinawa and go to mainland Japan, who go to Hawaii, who come to the United States, or even hang out at the US military base on Okinawa, guess what? They develop the same problems and diseases like the rest of Western civilization. So it has nothing to do with them being in Okinawa, it has everything to do with the way that they live their lives. Okay, let's look at another group of centenarians, Sardinia, Italy, okay, where in the highlands, men and uh, people routinely live over 100, and this goes back all the way to the Bronze Age. Uh, they also eat a plant-based diet uh, and a modest amount of red wine. They engage in active work throughout the span of their entire lives. And again, this is a particular uh, country, a group of people that revere their elders. And maybe they took something from that biblical passage, uh, revere your elders and you will extend your life. So now we've seen two pockets, the Okinawans in Japan and the Sardinians in Italy. And you say, well, they probably intermarry and they probably interbreed and you know, they're all genetically related. 
So does it work when you're not genetically related? Ooh, yes it does. Loma Linda, California, home of the Seventh-day Adventists. Guess what? Not genetically related. Simply bound by religion. Okay? Like Orthodox Jews, they don't work from uh, Friday in the evening to Saturday in the evening. And during Saturdays, they hang out together. They take long walks. They're very spiritual. Okay? Um, and they're not genetically related. And in fact, the Seventh-day Adventists not only have a large percentage of centenarians, okay, but they live on average nine years longer, men and women, than their American counterparts. Nine years longer. Okay. And here's a uh, slide. Actually, somebody said so much for religion. So let's, let's talk about that for a moment, okay? Is being religious good for you? Does it help you live longer? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because of your belief? Lifestyle. Your community. So if you're religious living in a cave, okay? If you're Jewish and you're putting on your tefillin, if you're Catholic and you're counting your rosary beads, okay? And you're living in a cave by yourself, you're not going to stay alive longer. It's the social interaction, and you're going to hear that theme over and over again, the social interaction. That's why religion keeps us alive longer. It's going to the synagogue, to the church, to the mosque, wherever you go, interacting with other people. Okay, here is a very interesting uh, graph. I don't know how well you can see it. It shows the overlap between those three communities that we just discussed, the Seventh-day Adventists in California, the Sardinians, and the Okinawans. And what we have in the middle here, I don't know how well you can see, these are the things that they have in common. The importance of family, okay? They don't smoke. They eat plant-based diets. Constant, moderate physical activity, okay? Again, none of these centenarians that we're talking about are going to high-priced gyms. None of them are signing up in January for gym membership, <laughs> canceling it in March or April after they haven't gone to the gym. Okay? They've probably never even been inside of a gym. You don't need a gym. You don't need expensive equipment. In fact, at MD Prevent, we teach you how to find more exercise with very basic $10 straps and stuff like that because that's the kind of stuff you need. You need to get out and walk. You need to find opportunities to exercise in every regard. And I'll give you an example. You go to the supermarket, right? You got a shopping cart. Take something that's not so heavy, and while you're walking to your car, go like this. Build your muscle. If the bags aren't too heavy, carry the bags instead of taking the wagon, okay? If you've got these TV shows, the real housewives of somewhere, Okay? Revenge, jealousy, whatever they call the TV shows. You gotta watch your show, okay? You'd rather be dead than give up these TV shows. While you're sitting there, take a weight and do some weight. Okay? Do the right hand, do the left hand, lift your left leg, lift your right leg, do something. Okay? Nobody's telling you you gotta change every last aspect of your life to live longer. Most of you probably don't wanna do that. You gotta find opportunities to find exercise, and you got to be creative about it, okay? When somebody needs something, be the first one to jump up, okay? All right, so it's time for a break. Actually, break dance. No. All right, everybody.